Good morning. It's seven o'clock. You're watching the only breakfast show live from Westminster. And today, Israeli Palestinian violence escalates with rockets fired at the tourist capital of Tel Aviv and street clashes in one Israeli town. So, how will world leaders respond? Well, the Environment Secretary, George Eustace, is on the programme shortly. Plus, we'll bring you the very latest GDP figures this hour and talk to the Shadow Business Secretary, Ed Miliband, about the UK's economic outlook. Also for you this morning, Cool Runnings, the inside story of how the biggest names in track cycling were beaten by a team of amateurs, all thanks to reverse engineering. And as part of Mental Health Awareness Week, Love Island star Jack Fincham will be with us to talk about the pressures that some men face to get that so-called perfect appearance. It is Wednesday, the 12th of May. Rockets over Tel Aviv. The Israeli Prime Minister says Hamas will pay a heavy price following an attack on Israel's tourist capital. Well, Israel steps up its airstrikes on Gaza, where 35 Palestinians, including 10 children, have been killed. We speak to the Israeli Defense Force. It seems that what Israel is doing in Gaza, Gaza is totally disproportionate to what is happening here. I would uh, beg to differ. I think that what we are doing are specific strikes against military targets. COVID hotspots. Sky News reveals the dozens of areas facing increasing coronavirus infection rates as local leaders call for emergency vaccinations. Struck by lightning, a nine-year-old boy dies after apparently being hit by lightning in a football field in Blackpool. Police continue a search in Gloucester after claims a teenager feared to have been murdered by Fred West could be buried there. We'll talk to Rose West, former lawyer. And back in business, the Brit Awards sees the return of live events with no social distancing for fans in what turned out to be a big night for female artists. And the weather stays rather mixed over the next few days. On the one hand, we need the rainfall. On the other, we like the sunshine. To find out what the day has in store, join me for the weather details later in the programme. Well, very good morning to you. We start with the escalating tensions in Israel, with rockets fired and intercepted by defence systems at the tourist capital Tel Aviv and street clashes in one Israeli town between Arab Israelis and Israeli police. Well, overnight, Hamas militants launched a rocket attack on the capital city of Tel Aviv. Five people have died in Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Hamas will pay a heavy price. Israel, meanwhile, has stepped up its airstrikes on Gaza, where 35 Palestinians have been killed, including 10 children. Well, the scale of the Hamas attack on Tel Aviv appears to be unprecedented, aimed at penetrating Israel's high-tech Iron Dome system. Mark Stone reports now from Ashkelon in Israel, subject to another attack earlier in the day. Overnight in Tel Aviv, images that change everything in an escalation that has already spiralled so fast. Israel's missile defence systems lighting up the sky as they try to intercept incoming Hamas rockets. 130 of them were fired from Gaza in one barrage. Flights at the international airport were urgently suspended and diverted. Hamas said it was a specific target. And on the streets, injured Israelis, which, for Israel, will move this conflict onto a different level. The earlier Israeli assault on Gaza, which prompted the Hamas retaliation, had been relentless. And for those who are not the targets, but who are so often the victims, it is terrifying. With the weight of the Israeli Air Force on top of them, there is nowhere safe to run. Locals filmed the moment a 13-storey building collapsed. It's not clear how many people were in it at the time. It is a residential block. The Israelis had earlier said that they were targeting militants in their homes. The number confirmed to have died through the day and the night before continues to rise. Children too. Here, a mother and her son are buried. They're from a refugee camp 
most in Gaza are refugees. And in one of the hospitals, agony and defiance. This man vows revenge for the death of his comrade, a member of Hamas's Jerusalem Brigade. On the Israeli side of the fence, which locks Gaza off, in the city of Ashkelon, the air raid sirens sounded through the day. In the skies, the trails of Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system. It shot down most of the Hamas rockets. The Israeli communities here are used to attacks from Gaza, but not this many in just a few hours. Well, this is the third time it's happened since we've been here. Uh, the, you hear the, uh, the wail of the sirens, and then moments later, uh, sometimes the thud of the rockets as they, they come in. Uh, from Gaza, there have been scores of rockets over the course of the past few hours, most of them hitting here around this town. Amala Wade, the home of an elderly lady and her carer, they both died, unable to get to the shelter in time. The Israeli Defense Forces spokesman was here, keen to show us what Israel faces from Hamas. No one can look at this and, and, and see anything other than a, a tragedy uh, that has happened here. Um, but the images that are coming out of Gaza are truly horrific. It seems that what Israel is doing in Gaza, Gaza is totally disproportionate to what is happening here. I would uh, beg to differ. I think that what we are doing are specific strikes against military targets inside Gaza that are part of the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad's military infrastructure. And on top of all this, another deeply worrying development. Overnight, serious clashes between Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs in towns within Israel. A new active fracture. Let's go in, let's go in. Through the night, the rockets continued. Hamas claims to be the defender of the Palestinian cause striking their occupier. Israel will strike back harder still, and the diplomacy to break this cycle isn't there. Mark Stone, Sky News, in southern Israel. Well, let's talk to our foreign affairs editor, Deborah Haynes, who's in Jerusalem for us this morning. And clearly this attack on Tel Aviv it is a, a severe escalation. Well, an escalation that has prompted um, from the Israeli side significant airstrikes into Gaza um, up until this morning. The Israelis saying that they have been going after intelligence, um, intelligence officials, the, um, the homes of Hamas leaders, rocket launch sites. But obviously it's a densely populated area. And as we're seeing, the... Um, the, the um, health officials in Gaza saying civilians are being targeted and killed. Um, the Israelis say that a more than a thousand rockets have been launched towards Israel since Monday, most of them intercepted, um, but, but some of them falling into Israel and about 200 falling short into Gaza. And as Mark alluded to in his piece, there are also frictions here in Israel with cities, with Arab Israeli populations, unrest growing there, a state of emergency called, caused, called in one city uh, of Lod. OK, Deborah, thank you. Well, uh, we're joined in the studio by the Environment Secretary, George Eustace. Good to see you this morning. Look, can I ask first and foremost for a, a reaction to what we're seeing in Israel? Because clearly this is now escalating at some pace. Yes, look, it's very concerning. It's clearly a, a very uh, febrile atmosphere there at the moment. Uh, these rocket attack, uh, attacks that are taking place for, you know, from Gaza into Israel, obviously completely unacceptable, but we've really got to now de-escalate things. And I, I think the Foreign Secretary will be saying a bit more about this later today. Uh, I'm sure that he's uh, in touch, in, in, in endorsing and trying to get all of those involved you know, to de-escalate and calm this situation. I mean, of course, uh, with, with Tel Aviv being attacked, um, Israel's only recently gone on the green list. There's no uh, official change in advice for travelling to Israel at the moment on the, on the FCO website. Is, is that going to change? Well, look, the FCO keep all of this uh, under review, both for you know security and uh, safety reasons, but also then uh, the Department for Health also and the Department for Transport have those lists linked to the uh, pandemic. So there, there are different reasons why the Foreign Office might change their advice, but they do uh, review it regularly. Um, can I ask you about one thing which is causing a lot of concern at the moment, and that are these COVID hotspots, which, which we've discovered. And, and certainly in 22 uh, local areas, there seems to have been a dramatic rise 
actually in, in the number of, of COVID infections taking place. How concerned are you that this is happening? Well, we do monitor this closely. So we, uh, we're doing a lot of lateral flow testing now, surveillance testing, uh, both in schools with uh, regular testing at home, but also now uh, in workplaces. And then that does enable us to pick up these hotspots. We're not quite uh, sure what could be driving it, whether it's uh, particular um, uh, variants that are taking hold there, whether it's that... Uh, in certain areas, people are um, perhaps being a bit too lax about the restrictions that remain in place. Um, so we're, we're unclear about that, but we are monitoring these um, situations carefully. But overall, uh, the picture is a good one, where we've got uh, falling incidents of the virus. Uh, and obviously, with the success of the vaccine rollout as well, far fewer hospitalisations and uh, deaths now at a very low level. I mean, there, there is concern that some of this may be linked to, to some variants coming in, which raises concerns as that you need to... To, to sort of stamp on this quickly to stop it having a wider impact in the country. So with that in mind, what do you make of, I mean, some local leaders calling for emergency vaccination programmes in these limited areas, could that be looked at? Well, we've generally taken the view that because we've got uh, capacity in place right across the country, we should just keep moving through uh, those cohorts in, uh, in age order. So we're just moving down through the age ranges. Once you start bringing in uh, complications, it, it gets more difficult to, uh, to, to, to deliver, uh, makes it more complicated and potentially means you, you slow down the overall vaccination programme. So the recommendation from the, the Joint Committee uh, on Vaccinations is that we should just keep moving down through the age ranges and that's what we've been doing quite successfully. What, what about uh, the possibility of regional restrictions then or even sort of tighter local restrictions on some areas where where we are seeing this increase? Well, look, we can't rule anything out, but, uh, you know, our plan that's been uh, set out uh, by the Prime Minister, the reason we're being incredibly cautious about exiting lockdown is we want this to be the last. Uh, we want to try and avoid having to get into a tiered system and regionalisation. We tried that last autumn. We know, uh, you know, we, know, we know that in the end we had to go for a full lockdown. We've got our confidence now in the vaccination programme that's rolling out, that is uh, delivering. Uh, it is also reducing transmission rates as well as uh, reducing uh, hospitalisations and mortality. And so that's got to be our focus. But there is always a risk, uh, and the greatest risk probably we have is that a new variant uh, will come in that is uh, the vaccine is less effective against. And that's why we, we've got, we're a country that's got the, the best ability in the world to do genome sequencing on these new variants, wherever they might be. Is it fair to say, though, that nothing is off the table at this stage? Because so the tremendous progress that has been made and the roadmap still in place at the moment, I mean, you, you simply can't afford for that to start going backwards, can you? No, and it's why we've been so cautious at, um, at exiting the lockdown, taking things carefully one stage at a time. The Prime Minister, you know, now announcing uh, what we're going to do on May the 17th. Um, and we just have to basically take each step at a time, uh, look at the impacts of that. So far, the easements in restrictions that we've uh, made have been a success. They haven't led to uh, an increase in infection things have still continued to go in the right direction, so we've got the confidence to move to that next level. Uh, but it, it does, I think, show that, you know, there are, there are always risks here, which is why we should be cautious about the way we go about this. Uh, look, we hear there's going to be some word on, on the public inquiry into how the COVID pandemic has been handled. We're expecting that announcement today, are we? Well, look, there's, um, there will be a time and a place, I think, for an inquiry of that sort. Uh, I'm not aware that anything's being announced today on it. You know, for now, um, we're not out of this yet. Uh, we've still got uh, a huge amount to do. Obviously, it's been uh, a very traumatic episode for the whole world. Uh, and it's undoubtedly the case that everybody will want to learn lessons from it. Uh, it's been such a big event. Uh, but for now, we've still got to focus on uh, getting ourselves uh, out of this situation. We've made some great progress with the vaccine programme, but we've got to keep our focus on that. Can I ask you about the Bally Murphy 10? The inquest yesterday uh, found that they were entirely innocent. I mean, this obviously dating back to 1971. But do we need to see some official ap apology being made now? Well, look, we've only just obviously had uh, this judgment uh, from the coroner. Um, I'm sure that Brandon Lewis in the Northern Ireland office uh, and others in government will be looking at this uh, closely and then we'll, you know, we'll give a, give a response to it. Uh, but, you know, these, it's, the, the Troubles were an incredibly difficult episode uh, in our country's history. We have now had some of these... 
uh, inquiries. This latest one, I think, started almost a decade ago and has just concluded. Uh, but I'm, sh I'm sure that we'll be looking at that carefully before responding to it. I mean, it's interesting, though, looking at, at, at David Cameron when there was the Bloody Sunday inquiry. He said, you do not defend the British Army by defending the indefensible. Of course, and um, you know um, that still uh, that does still that that does still stand. I mean, it's why at the same time, um, an inquiry, the coroner's uh, inquest started on this particular incident. Yeah, but, but I mean, when when this ruling has been made that these were ten innocent people, surely that there, there can't be a, a great deal that needs to be considered before an apology is made on the basis that you know, it, it could actually make significant inroads into healing some of this, couldn't it? Well, <clears throat> look, I haven't seen the uh, the, the full uh, inquest uh, report yet. It's only uh, just been published. Uh, you know, and if uh, I'm not going to preempt, it's obviously the responsibility of Brandon Lewis and the Northern Ireland office to uh, look at these matters. I'm sure they'll be studying this uh, closely before responding uh, to it. So I, I, I can't say any more than that at this stage. Um, can I talk about animal welfare? Because I know you're you're involved in in this new move that the the UK is making about protecting animals in the UK and abroad, actually, which is applying um, not only to pets but to livestock. How how does this work? Uh, well, there, there's a, a very wide range of um, announcements that we have in this document we're publishing today. Uh, when it comes to livestock, uh, we had a manifesto commitment to ban the live export of animals. Uh, we will be bringing forward legislation to deliver that. Uh, we're also looking at issues such as um, transport, uh, journey times and so on on uh, livestock, uh, and, um, and also looking at things like slaughterhouse regulation. So it's a very wide ranging piece that we're looking at. It covers everything from microchipping of cats, dealing with the problem of puppy smuggling right through to that ban on live animal exports. I mean, it's, a, it's a huge area. I know one of the, one of the key points is you, you, it's now recognised or will be recognised officially in law that animals are sentient. Well, <laughs> we, those of us who are pet lovers, we knew that already, didn't we? Yes, um, <clears throat> we've always known that. Indeed, since uh, we first introduced animal welfare legislation as long ago as 1822, obviously, it uh, recognised that. Uh, what the Bill on Animal Sentience actually does, though, is we, we all know that animals are sentient, but it gives a role to a new Animal Sentience Committee to scrutinise uh, government policy in this area, changes to policy we make, uh, policies we ought to maybe consider, uh, and, it, and it puts it on a statutory footing to give us advice on these matters so that we can have a constant trajectory of improving animal welfare. Look, can I finally ask you about um, David Cameron and, and these gr the Green Seal texts? I know you used to work very closely with Mr Cameron. Um, the texts were, were sort of all published yesterday. You, you must have read them, surely. A bit cringeworthy, aren't they? Well, look, I've seen uh, some of them, and obviously the Prime Minister set up uh, the, the Beardman uh, review to look at all of this, uh, to look at this incident, and in particular in the context of the Greensill, uh, the, the Greensill episode. Um, but I think you also have to step back from this and say, well, the Prime Minister, yes, so a former Prime Minister, David Cameron, did uh, approach ministers, uh, did lobby on behalf of this company, but they didn't do him any special favours. You know, some of them looked at this again. In the end, they came back and said, uh, no can do. Uh, when we can't help you, uh, you don't fit the criteria, and the business went bust. So on the, on the face of it, nobody did any special favours for David Cameron. He approached them, but he was ultimately unsuccessful. OK, Minister, good to talk to you this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, now, there's some breaking news in the last couple of minutes. You can probably see it at the bottom of your screen. The latest GDP figures are out. Let's talk to our correspondent, Paul Kelso. What do they tell us, Paul? Uh, yeah, morning, Stephen. They tell us that the economy in the first quarter of this year shrank by 1.5%, uh, leaving the economy as a whole 8.7% still smaller than it was pre-pandemic levels. Of course, we spent the first quarter of this year and beyond in that deep lockdown, so no surprise that the economy uh, should have shrunk in that time. It didn't shrink as much as it did in the first lockdown, which is signs that we've become a bit more resilient and business has become a little bit uh, better at coping. And we as consumers have 
become better at coping with it. And uh, the glimmer of hope in these numbers from the uh, ONS that have come this morning is that the economy actually grew in March by 2.1%. And that's something I'm sure the Chancellor of the Cheka, Rishi Sunak, uh, will be talking about this morning. He's here. Uh, I'm here with him at a brewery in East London where he's going to be telling us how uh, he's going to organise uh, the recovery from this. There's been an initial response from the Chancellor. He said, uh, despite a difficult start to this year, economic growth in March is a promising sign of things to come. He goes on to talk about how the government's plan for jobs is working. He's uh, confident it will uh, keep unemployment below forecast levels and he will continue uh, to do to take all the steps necessary to support our recovery. Exactly what those steps might be as we move out of restrictions Certainly on Monday, when people will be able to come to places like this and go inside and have a drink for the first time in months, will be interesting. We look to hear if there's any plans for any stimulus to try and get us spending again or whether he's uh, going to rely on us being confident in the vaccine programme uh, to move on. We'll be hearing from the Chancellor in the next hour. As I say, he'll be clinging to that uh, glimmer of positive news that the economy grew in the last month, although it's down for the first quarter of the year, one and a half percent. OK, Paul, thank you. We'll sort of come for you this morning. Labour says there should have been more emphasis on what they call good jobs in the Queen's speech. We'll be joined by the Shadow Business and Energy Secretary, Ed Miliband, at five past eight. Rose West, former solicitor, joins us at 8.20 this morning after police in Gloucester begin searching a cafe over a link to a girl feared to have been murdered by her husband. The government revealed in yesterday's Queen's speech that it wants to ban junk food adverts online and on TV before nine o'clock. We'll talk about that at half past eight this morning. Now, we've been investigating the current COVID hotspots in the UK. Research by Sky News shows the number of coronavirus cases is continuing to rise in 28 local authorities across the UK. 22 areas of England have double the average infection rate. But let's have a look at some of the details. The highest case is in Hindburn, where almost 200 infections were recorded per 100,000 people as the case rate shot up by more than 200%. In Bolton, 158.9 cases were recorded per 100,000 people. A uh, similar number of cases recorded in Selby. While well, Derry City and Strabane had uh, 158.6. Well, the Shadow Health Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth, pointed to some of the factors that may be behind the rise. Part of this is because of uh, uh, the lack of sick pay. If you're on low paid work, a zero hours contract, you cannot take time off work to isolate your, yourselves if you're ill or if you've been in contact with someone who is ill. That has been the biggest failure of this pandemic, failing to offer people decent sick pay and support to stay at home. We've also got to look at how we're rolling out vaccination. Some parts of the country have better vaccination rates than other parts. Let's talk to our reporter, Hanish Sethi. And it's interesting, George Eustace is saying just a, a couple of minutes ago that, you know, the, the government will not rule out adding local restrictions to these areas if necessary. Exactly, and that's quite worrying, actually, for people in that area. But it's quite an interesting picture if we look at that overall, because on the whole, uh, case rates of coronavirus in the UK have remained relatively low. On, low. on average, there are about 40 cases per 100,000. But there are these pockets of um, areas throughout the UK where cases have simply spiked. Um, Sky News has been looking at the data, and we're going to show you a graph of two particular areas of concern. One is Hindburn in Lancashire, and it's seen over a 200% rise in cases. The case rate there is almost 200 per 100,000. And in Bolton, just northwest of Manchester, that's seen an infection rate of 160 cases per 100,000. So both those areas are well above the national average. And you might think that that's actually to do with more tests being conducted, but this simply isn't accurate. The number of tests has actually been quite stable. 
table. This is the positivity rate that's risen. Both these locations, as we can see on the graph, is seeing a 5% positive infection rate. And the World Health Organization is saying that for the virus to be under control, the proportions of positive tests should be less than 5%. But let's put that into perspective because the rates we were seeing on the graph back in November were positive rates of 20%. So at the moment, we're well below that. But this is something that local authorities will be keeping an eye on. Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester, believes that the spike might actually be to do with international travel. But we do have to be mindful of these figures as restrictions will be easing from Monday next week. But on the whole, though, looking at the UK data, it is looking a much better picture. OK, Hannah, thank you. A nine-year-old boy has died in Blackpool after reportedly being struck by lightning while playing football. It happened during a private coaching session on a playing field in Common Edge Road uh, in Blackpool on Tuesday evening when a thunderstorm hit the town. Lancashire police say he was taken to hospital but did not survive. Police will today continue their search of a cafe in Gloucester after reports a woman feared to have been murdered by serial killer Fred West may have been buried there. Mary Bastow was 15 when she disappeared in 1968. Fred West was said to be a regular customer when the teenager worked at the cafe. The Foreign Secretary is expected to reveal that 80 schools and colleges have come under serious cyber attack. In a speech later, Dominic Raab will warn Britain must be better protected against hostile states and criminal gangs. More than 1,000 petrol stations in the eastern United States have run out of fuel, apparently. There's been panic buying in parts of the country after a major pipeline was closed down by a cyber attack last week. The search for a nine-month-old tiger is continuing in Texas after its owner was arrested in connection with a murder investigation. The big cat was most recently seen after a standoff with an armed off-duty police officer. Lawyers for 26-year-old Victor Hugo Cuevas says they can't confirm that he is the owner. Now, female artists dominated last night's Brit Awards as the event marked something like a return to normal life. An audience of a few thousand people who didn't have to social distance saw Little Mix and Dua Lipa steal the show. Our arts and entertainment correspondent, Lucy Cotter, reports. So At this year's Brit Awards, the real winner was the live music industry as it took one step closer to getting back to normal. This was the first major indoor live music event since the start of the pandemic. 4,000 people under one roof with no masks and no social distancing. Part of the government's pilot scheme made possible by COVID tests for everyone. And for the stars, being back on the red carpet was a prize in itself. We haven't been on stage with an actual audience for like, for me, like over a year and a half. So, yeah, I, I think I might have to hold a couple of tears back tonight, do you know what I mean? The last live show I did, I did my first headline show and it was 200 people in a room. And now I'm here in the O2, so it's, yeah, terrifying. Little me! The other big winner of the night was women, after last year's awards were heavily criticised for being male-dominated, with Little Mix becoming the first female act ever to win Best Group. It's not easy being a female in the UK pop industry. We've seen the white male dominance, misogyny, sexism and lack of diversity. So this award isn't just for us, it's for the Spice Girls, Sugar Babes, All Saints, Girls Aloud. <laughs> This one's for you. <laughs> and best album went to Dua Lipa, who also got best female solo artist and gave a shout out to the two and a half thousand key workers in the audience. There's a massive disparity between gratitude and respect for frontline workers because it's very good to clap for them, but we need to pay them. Give a massive, massive round of applause and give Boris a message that we all support a fair pay rise for our front line. Thank you so much. So while
all other award ceremonies this year bombed, the Brits has managed to pull off an important test event, pull in the big names and give us a taste of what we've all been missing. Lucy Gotter, Sky News. After that, I feel positively underdressed. I don't know about you, Joe Wheeler. We could do with a few more sparkles, couldn't we, this morning? Well, if you just told me, I, I would have dressed accordingly and it would have been fine. But uh, in terms of being underdressed, maybe it's probably best to dress for the weather today. Um, temperatures reaching around 18 degrees Celsius and for most it's a frost-free morning once again. But the trend is downhill, I'm afraid, as we go towards the weekend. Let's take a look at the weather details. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello there, good morning to you. Well, over the next few days, we're going to keep low pressure close by and that's just generating these showers. Sometimes showers, sometimes longer spells of rain and certainly for central southern parts of the country and Wales, we will see some more persistent rain through the course of the day. But for many of us this morning, break, we're waking up to some bright skies, more in the way of cloud over northern parts of Scotland. We already have quite a raft of showers in the north and the west. Elsewhere, some sunshine. And certainly where we do have the sunshine, 17, 18 degrees Celsius, fairly likely, mid-teens elsewhere. It's through the afternoon that we start to see this area of low pressure tracking its way through the channel and bringing some wet weather through those central southern areas and then all of that pushing its way northwestwards back into Wales. Now, I mentioned about the shower. They could be heavy, they could be slow moving. Once again, there could be some hail mixed in, some thunder and lightning as well. And those very volatile showers are most likely over parts of Northern Ireland, also northern parts of England. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Joe, thank you. Still to come this morning as research by Sky News shows rising levels of coronavirus in 28 local areas of the UK. We'll talk to the leader of Barnsley Council in just a couple of minutes. Witnessed how the Catalan fight for independence split families. It was from this chamber that Carlos Puigdemont declared independence in October. I come here because I want to show other people what happened. I'm Michelle Clifford and I'm Sky's Europe correspondent. It's not the aim of the smugglers to actually get people to UK shores, but simply into British waters. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. There are real concerns here now about whether the health system will be able to cope. President Macron has spoken in defence of freedom of expression, saying France won't give up its caricatures and drawings made by people who dare to challenge. Afternoon, Mr Barnier. How are you? I have no time for any politics. anger at the government, anger about wider social and economic problems in this nation. We are on the verge of fascism and we have a country to save.
Well, let's get a little bit more on one of our top stories this morning. Research by Sky News showing the number of coronavirus cases is continuing to rise in 28 local authorities across the UK. Well, one of those is Barnsley, and Sir Stephen Houghton is the Barnsley Council leader and joins us now. Look, it's good to see you, Sir Stephen. Why do you think that the infection rate is increasing in Barnsley? Well, good morning. Um, I, th I think the infection rates um, are still relatively low compared to where they were a number of months ago, but obviously we're concerned that we're not following the national trend. Um, and I think the reasons for that are already well documented. First of all, we've got communities with relatively poor health, um, and that makes them susceptible to the disease and also poor outcomes from the disease. Um, we have and that deprivation that drives that poor health also drives mutual dependency in families. So we get mixing at times when we really didn't need it. But one of the biggest reasons I think is as people return to work, um, we have large employers, we don't have much home working. And clearly when you get into large institutions, there's a danger that the virus will spread. So those reasons have been around for a while. And as the restrictions come off, obviously they make us more susceptible to the disease increasing. Yeah, which must raise concerns about next Monday onwards. Where obviously, people can go into restaurants, go inside of pubs and bars and what have you. I mean, is there anything that you can do as a council to try and slow things down? Well, the first thing is, obviously, we're, we're looking at our messaging for next week because we want people to realise uh, the disease is still out there. It's not all over. Uh, the disease is still there. We've got to be careful. And so strengthening the communications again is going to be really important. But what we've also asked the government is to look at these places with high rates of infection to see if we can roll out the vaccine even quicker. Because we know the vaccine's made a real difference, not just in terms of keeping people safe, but in stopping the spread of the disease. So if we can get to some of those younger age groups, because it is largely now in those younger age groups where we're seeing the infections. So getting, getting the vaccine to those people, getting them vaccinated as quickly as possible, we think we can start to bring those numbers down. And obviously the concerns we have for next week and beyond, uh, we can allay those as quickly as possible. I mean, the word from that, we've just spoken to George Eustace, seems to be no, that they're not going to do that. And on the advice of the, the Committee on, on Vaccination, saying you know, that the, the best approach is just to continue the rollout. But what he didn't rule out was the possibility of perhaps some local restrictions being applied. Now, that isn't the ideal solution, of course, but is it one you'd be willing to accept if necessary? Well, we've got to do all we can to tackle the disease. And if that's the solution we are given, then clearly we, we're not going to have any other options to put into play. Um, the government have said to us so far that uh, that is unlikely at this stage, further restrictions. I think what the government's really worrying about um, are the emergence of new variants. And clearly, if that happens, then we would expect restrictions to come back into force. All I can do is, is to say to the government, we know what works is the vaccine. And whilst, you know, um, I understand a broad rollout is the preferred option, when we've covered most of the older age groups, when we've covered the vast majority of vulnerable people, then I think we've got to start and think about where we can be a bit more uh, pointed in terms of where we go with the vaccine because we don't want to see further outbreaks and we certainly don't want to see new variants coming from those outbreaks. So we'll keep the pressure on the government, um, yes, to get the vaccine to as many people as possible across the country, but just maybe just to think about where we can be most effective with it. Uh, in, in terms of the vaccine rollout in Barnes, I mean, where are you in terms of, of, of the take-up amongst those age groups that, that are currently eligible? I mean, are you seeing people really wanting to, to get involved in this programme? I mean, the vaccine in Barnsley so far has been a success story. Um, older age groups, the vast majority now, you know, uh, it's, it's something like 96, 97% have, have been completed and we're now working our way down the, injury, the age range. 
So very little resistance um, to getting a vaccine, which is really good. Um, the NHS, uh, working with the council, have done a fantastic job in, in getting vaccines available and getting them out there. And people have responded very well. But as I say, it's getting to those younger age groups we need to do as quickly as possible now, because that's where we're seeing the infections rise. OK, so Stephen Horton, good to talk to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, the breaking news this morning, that's official figures showing the UK economy shrank by 1.5% in the first quarter of this year. But there are some signs of a bounce back in March. Well, let's talk to Henry Murison, the director of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, uh, who joins us now. Good to see you this morning. Look, in terms of the, uh, of the bounce back, how encouraged are you by that? I think the figures in March are welcome, but remember... GDP is a measure not just of private sector activity. So those figures you see for March largely recognise the reopening of schools. My wider concern, Stephen, is we're still 8.7% down in terms of lost output from where we were in the last quarter of 2019. Um, and that also doesn't take into account the fact we would have liked to see some GDP growth in that period. So the economy is significantly further behind where it otherwise would have been. And I think when you see uh, the Chancellor and others today out in the media, I think we'll be hoping to see not just on your channel, but across across the media, that there is a strong plan from the government to continue to support the economy and also to think about the recovery, because there are many people who have lost their jobs in this crisis. We need to get them retrained, we need to get them into other jobs. And there is a huge role for the private sector to play there, but there's also a role for the government to ensure that on big projects, on areas like HS2 and Northern Powers Rail, the big decisions coming in the next few weeks, that we don't see cutbacks the Treasury wanting to, to move back, because the risk of that is it could obviously affect confidence in the market. I mean, obviously, the, the, the retraining issue, the government may argue some of that was addressed in the Queen's speech yesterday with looking further at, at adult education and what have you. But uh, in, in terms of direct moves that, that can be made on the economy then, it's more about well, just making sure that, that you know, the, um, the sort of capital investment, if you like, continues. Is, 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 that, is that the main focus of your argument? I think we need to see long-term strategic choices to improve productivity. And many of that, the sort of spending decisions that will do that, will obviously have the benefit of creating jobs in the short term. You've also got a huge role for our metro mayors to play. So they themselves could be given more borrowing powers to invest in shovel-ready projects. Because although Whitehall can get people back to work through investing in projects from the centre, they can also give freedoms to people like Andy Burnham, uh, to those like Ben Houchen up in Teesside, to spend money as well. Because we do need to see all the government's funding in this period is being well used on long-term strategic investments, but that also has the benefit of short-term job creation. And if the Treasury holds back, wants to wait and see how the economy pans out, it may actually make the crisis worse. There is going to be some instability in the end of this year when the furlough schemes are removed. What we need to see is the government's long-term investment in levelling up really paying dividends in that period and not being left till later in the Parliament when the short-term demand issues will have gone and the benefit of doing that spending now will have been lost. But look, is, the, is there a danger then, in your view, that this, the 2% growth that we've seen, I know it's all relative, but the 2% growth we've seen in March, we, it, it's very important then, is it, in your view, that we don't rest on our laurels with that? That has to just be the, the initial step to pushing this harder and harder. I think, as I said, the, the challenge with that March figure is that monthly figures are very volatile. And that largely isn't private sector rebounding. What you're actually seeing is, is, is schools reopening because that's counted in those GDP figures. So I don't think that the March figures actually give you enough to be really genuinely confident that we're seeing things getting better. Of course, it's great the schools are reopened, but it doesn't mean private sector activity is back to normal. And in our big cities in particular, down in London, actually, but in our other large cities here in the north, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, the hospitality economy, places like Liverpool, is really important, actually, to Liverpool. So if you don't see support for the wider economy in those city regions, then those places that have driven the economy of this country for the last few years will be held back. Obviously, London usually recovers better from recessions, but across all our city regions, we need to trust those places that also all have metro mayors to lead their own recovery. I mean, that's why our chair, George Osborne, has been really clear, why others, not just myself, have been making the case to the Chancellor to trust local mayors with more borrowing powers. That's something that can be done now. Actually, it's all investments that will be paid back 
that will generate revenue. So it's not about the government being worse off. It's about making strategic investments now that will pay back in the long term. But in, but in, in terms of, of, of seeing what is going to happen and having a positive outlook, I mean, the fact that, as you say, there's, a, there's an awful, awful lot of focus on things like bars, restaurants, hospitality... Um, I mean, th those are things which are really going to start opening up from next Monday. That's going to make a huge difference, isn't it? Of course, it's good to see those areas coming back. We have to remember we did have relatively high levels of employment in many sort of left-hand places before the crisis. We also have the challenge of people who are stuck in lower-wage jobs but actually want to get into higher-skilled jobs. And the wider challenge in our economy that I think has been brought to the fore is that actually we had a productivity crisis before <laughs> COVID. So what we can't do is ignore the structural economic issues, the fact we've got a significant north-south divide in productivity terms. And that's why those kind of big projects I mentioned, as well as short-term reforms, the, the better bus system that Andy Burnham has been talking about, mm -hmm. that will improve productivity in great measure. But we also need to see those longer-term projects, because otherwise we're recovering to the world we were in before. And okay. the challenge, I think, Stephen, is that that economy wasn't, wasn't working for everyone. We need an economy after the crisis that works the whole country. OK, Henry, really good to talk to you this morning. Thank you. Well, some concerns there, but we have just heard really a positive message from the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak. He's just said this. Well, I think actually today's figures show that our economy is clearly getting back on track and crucially that our plan for jobs is working. Now, of course, many businesses and families are still facing tough times and that's why our support is continuing. Well, our political correspondent Joe Pike is here. Support continuing, as Henry Murison was saying there, they actually want to see more of it. Yeah, indeed. And Richard Tunak now has perhaps far more flexibility with these GDP figures, with uh, Bank of England upgrading their growth forecast for the rest of this year, which they did uh, last week. It's important because we know the government spent around £300 billion on the COVID pandemic. And he looked um, quite limited in what he could do as Chancellor, what he could spend money on. But now he does have flexibility. And looking ahead to the next election, that is important. It suggests that uh, tax hikes can perhaps be avoided. He has perhaps £20 billion uh, to play with, according to one uh, economist. And there are some key decisions coming up. He has, remember, uh, extended that universal credit uplift of £20 a week by uh, six months. How long will that last for? He'll be under pressure, certainly from the Labour Party, to continue it. And perhaps, Stephen, he now has a room to do so. But it will be, uh, it'll be interesting to see what he does, some key choices to make. But he has perhaps now that flexibility if this, um, this sort of uh, boom continues and the economy restarts in such a positive way as these stats today suggest. OK, Joe, thank you. Now, it has been one of the most violent nights in recent history in the Middle East. At least 35 Palestinians and three Israelis have been killed. And amongst those Palestinian deaths, actually, quite a, a number of children, as we understand it. Well, let's talk to Leila Moran, who's a Lib Dem spokesperson for foreign affairs and international development, and who also has family who live uh, in the West Bank. Good to see you this morning. I mean, look, clearly this is a, a hugely concerning situation with this real escalation in violence absolutely and uh, you know we wake up this morning to as you say the death toll rising the number of injured uh is also rising on the palestinian side over 700 i understand now um and we've lost children uh some as young as one year old i mean it's really a tragic situation but what's even worse is it does look like it's getting worse the un special envoy uh, has said that uh, it's moving towards uh, war. And uh, this comes off the back of not just further airstrikes in Gaza, uh, but also for the first time since 1966, the uh, Israeli government has called a state of emergency in the city of Lod. Um, this is not good. Um, so today in Parliament, I've called uh, an urgent question. The Speaker has granted uh, that so that we can discuss it. And what I'll be calling on uh, for the government to do is to engage with our international partners to ensure de-escalation. Um, oh, because but, unless... Forgive, you... forgive me for jumping in. Ah. Forgive me for jumping in. How does the government do that? Because as we know from this hugely volatile situation over the decades, uh, it, that, is the, that is the big question, how you de-escalate this situation. Who do you apply the pressure to? 
Well, in the first instance, uh, this has to be done through the United Nations. As imperfect as it is, uh, it is the best forum for this. Uh, and should there be draft resolutions that come forward, historically, Britain has been quite lukewarm um, towards uh, these kinds of resolutions. We actually need them to be quite robust at the moment. Um, but there are other things that Britain can also do. Um, first of all, it's worth remarking that this started uh, over, uh, if they happen, potentially illegal evictions in an area uh, called Sheikh Jarrah. Um, this comes off the back of uh, other illegal activity in the eyes of international law, uh, demolitions and also increased settlements that the Israeli government uh, has allowed to happen. And the international community so far, whilst they have condemned it, haven't really done anything about it at all. Um, a UN resolution, I understand, is potentially being drafted. And I would encourage the government to stand by it, regardless of what America may or may not do. Actually, what we need now is the full force of the international community to say this has to stop, to encourage a ceasefire. And it's not just the Israeli government, it's also Hamas. Uh, who need to step back. The escalation of the rocket fire towards Tel Aviv is not helpful. Um, we need people to put down their arms, to stop killing innocent civilians, to stop killing children, and to get back around the negotiation table. And critical to all of this is that peace negotiation, is allowing the Palestinians to be able to hold elections. They were put off because the Israeli government said that they couldn't campaign in East Jerusalem. Um, it's not acceptable that you have one state deciding the political uh, future of another. This is not right. So there is a lot that the international community can do, but first, we have to stop the killing. I was going to say, because we're within all of this, and every time we talk to, to the leaders of Israel or, or members of the Israeli Defence Force, of course, they, they come back with a clear argument. You know, they're, they're defending themselves, they're responding to... I mean, what did we see in Tel Aviv last night? Something like 150 rockets fired towards what is the tourist capital uh, of, of, uh, of Israel. I mean, no wonder there has been some sort of response, even though it, it may be argued it was disproportionate. Disproportionate, but also you've got it the wrong way round here because it was the Israeli authorities, firstly through not defending the attacks on worshippers on the most holy night of Ramadan at the third most holy place for the Muslim community internationally at the Al-Aqsa Mosque that caused this. There were hundreds injured in that. They were shooting rubber bullets at them. Um, this is in it of itself disproportionate. Actually, what the Israeli authorities there should have done was to protect the innocent worshippers from the extremists, and instead they escalated the situation at that stage. Um, so at this point, what we need to do is to get everyone to get around the table, to put down their arms and to stop attributing this who started it blame game. But we also have to remember uh, that when you uh, have violence, when violence occurs, violence begets violence. And I think it is really critical that the UN Special Envoy is now saying out loud that this could be escalating into war. Um, I really don't want that. No one wants that. In the end, it is innocent civilians who will be caught in the crossfire. The death toll is only rising at the moment. And it's absolutely right, I think, that us as British parliamentarians put pressure on our government to work with others to do what they can to de-escalate this. And remember, Britain has a historic responsibility towards Palestine. In 1917, uh, 17, the Balfour Declaration made clear that it wanted... Uh, Palestinians and the new Israeli state to live peacefully together. Um, and there are issues with the Balfour Declaration, not least uh, the political rights of Palestinians. But nevertheless, Britain itself has an important part to play in this. And I hope today we will hear from the minister what they plan to do about it. I mean, the problem is, though, whatever pressure we put on, we, we seem to be talking to two immovable sides on here. You know, Hamas, of course, has got a a very long and very concerning reputation, doesn't seem to, to want to move. I mean, the government, still uh, headed by Benjamin Netanyahu, doesn't seem to want to move. We have, we have two extremes in play here, don't we? In the case of Hamas, yes, but Hamas, remember, does not speak for all Palestinians. Uh, they certainly don't speak for me and my family. Um, and in terms of uh, the Israeli government, I mean, there are factions within there that, that will 
uh, listen and, and do better. Um, and I think there is also certainly uh, a, a, an issue right now in terms of the uh, coalition forming that, that still needs to happen and, and the internal strife that we're seeing in their government. But there is also one last trump card that we have as a country, um, and that is to recognize the state of Palestine. The government has said that it wants to do it at the right time. Well, if the time is not now, then when? We have to appreciate that in this escalation, it is not equal. This is not an equal escalation. And any death is one death too many on either side, and it's a tragedy. But when you have a state that is fighting another, and that state is not recognized by countries as important in their history as Britain, that doesn't help. So actually, I think the time is now for the government to say, well, Israel, unless you put down your arms, we are going to recognize the state of Palestine. That would matter. That mm. would shift the dial. And it's within the gift of the British government. Leila Moran, good to talk to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello there. It's going to be another day of sunshine and showers. Some of those showers heavy with hail, thunder and lightning too. In between the showers where you get some sunshine, temperatures reaching around 18 Celsius, that's 64 degrees Fahrenheit. And then later this afternoon, we see some more persistent rain working its way into central southern England. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.